Mm. I'm just going to set the ball rolling with something that, I, that I've been thinking about for the last three or four days, ever since um, we discussed the topic. And I'm going to just, just to set Greg's sort of mental gears clicking because it doesn't take much for his gears to start clicking. And also yours. So here's my, it's a postulation. Please feel free to debate and disagree with it afterwards. But I was thinking that um, is fact nowadays stranger than fiction? I was looking at three seminal incidents recently. One is Edward Snowden and the whole leaking of the NSA, um, uh, the whole uh, the idea of surveillance in America. You couldn't write it better than that. The second is the flash floods in Uttarakhand. You couldn't write a more gory and more grisly and unseen disaster that just creeps up on you like this and it's still playing out in its nightmare. And the third is the IPL saga. Again, you couldn't write it better. So I was thinking, what is it about these three in in incidences that has actually made facts stranger than fiction? And here's my hypothesis. I think it's because the world is bursting at the seams. I think in the case of Uttarakhand, climate change and the mad utilization of meager resources has resulted in something as grisly and freaky and worse than fiction that we've seen. I think when it comes to Edward Snowden and what's been happening with the files is again this whole idea of terrorism, 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 that surveillance is, is crossed boundaries beyond the pale of what fiction has written till now. And finally, uh, the IPL saga. I mean, again, if you're bursting at the seams, it's, we are bursting at the seams with uh, profligacy, with greed, with ambition, and stuff like that just starts pouring out. So that's my sort of central hypothesis to start the discussion, that we are bursting at the steam seams, which is why today fact is stranger than fiction. But perhaps it was always this crazy. Perhaps facts were always this weird, outlandish, extreme, and we didn't know. We just happen now to know a lot more about what's going on than we did before. So that's my, my second um, if. And finally, Fiction is getting increasingly factified, and fact is getting increasingly fictionalized. If you read Dan Brown's novels, you keep thinking, do you, do you think in that star, under that dome, in that place in Italy, really I'll find the Holy Grail? And that's a classic example of fiction being factified. And the reverse, the whole idea of long-form journalism, beautifully written in the New Yorker or the caravan in India, is fact getting fictionalized, not fictionalized, but certainly written in a way that we can actually receive it as fiction. So, just to, that's my, sort of, that's the, the limit of my intelligence. I'm done. <laughs> now, uh, I'm gonna um, ask you what your, seriously, what your, what your initial thoughts are, and then we'll take it from there. I like this very much, this question of sort of bursting at the seams, and uh, we are bursting at the seams. We're um, perpetrating on our mother, our planet, uh, an extinction event that is going to rival the great extinction event at the end of the Jurassic. We are going to annihilate, if we don't stop, almost all um, the ancillary species. It's actually written in a text somewhere that species not relevant to the survival of a human being, directly relevant, that is to their food, their protection and their utilization, are ancillary species. We are going to kill them all. They're not ancillary, of course. They have every right to be here. And some of them have been here for many, many, many millions of years longer than we have. I think that uh, we are bursting at the seams, and that is one critical part of this. But this has been going on for a long time. It's been getting worse and worse for a long time. I think that what's happening, in a larger sense, stepping back from it, and the reason why, for me, fact is, as a fiction writer, Fact is stranger and sometimes more fun, more amazing, astounding than fiction. The reason why that's true now is because we are on the cusp of a great change. This is quite simply the most exciting time to be alive in the history of the human species. For the first two million years of our history, roughly, we were hunter-gatherers. We followed herds through the savannas and into the high plains. We braved the winters with the herds. As the herds moved to better climates, we went with them, picking off animals, eating them, following herds, picking up herbs and, and things along the way to live, roots and tubers and fruits and whatever else. And we did that for two million years. Then around 10,000 years ago, and that's the first human paradigm. That's our first paradigm, and it's about two million years. 
The second paradigm happened about 10,000 years ago, and it's called the Neolithic Revolution, when humans learned how to domesticate crops and animals. Before that, we followed the herds, and we were hunter-gatherers, and we were a moving population. Once we learned how to domesticate crops and animals, and it happened very, very quickly, after two million years, it happened almost overnight in the terms of our human history. And once we had this capacity to grow crops and to harvest them and to turn it into viable food that could be stored and kept through a winter, once we had the capacity to domesticate animals, starting with chickens and then with sheep and goats, etc., we had the capacity to keep the food with us alive through a winter. So we settled in one place to tend our crops and to tend our flocks of domesticated animals, which were our food source. And with that, originally, we would have perhaps encountered, as we established our, our clan, our group, with around our food source, others might have come who were still in the hunter-gatherer phase, who would smell the food, who might have been lost somewhere and might have missed the herd. They're hungry, there's winter, there's snow, they can smell food cooking. So they would come, and we were in our fixed place cooking food the food that we'd stored, the food that we'd domesticated. And they might ask us for some, being hungry, and at first we might give it to them. But after some time, we would be afraid because the food we have would be diminishing and we would think if we don't defend this food, we'll die. We are not hunter-gatherers anymore. We can't just walk behind the herd. We're growing food and storing it. This is our life now. So those spears we'd used to hunt animals were suddenly used to keep other human beings away. All of the most ancient art, human art, shows human beings joining together and throwing spears at animals to get food. And the hunt was so graphic and so important, so critical to the survival of the group, that it became the central aspect of our art. After the Neolithic Revolution, when we learned to domesticate animals and crops, and we stayed in one place, and we created clans, and clans of families that eventually became villages, and villages that became towns, and towns that became cities, and cities that became empires. From the point that we started doing this, the art changes. Instead of us throwing spears at animals, all the art shows human beings throwing spears at human beings. This is what we've done for 10,000 years. That way of thinking, that second great paradigm, of human history is coming to an end. It's characterized by two characteristics. The first is compete, and the second is consume. The last 10,000 years, which have been years that also produced great art, great science, great astonishing epics, this age is defined by these two words, compete, consume. And if you look at all of the people who are lauded and praised around the world today, they are people who personalize this concept, compete and consume. All of business is based on it. All of economics is based on it. This is changing. The new paradigm is coming, and we are in the transition phase right now. That new paradigm is cooperate and conserve. If we do not learn to cooperate with one another, we will be extinct. We will not survive. We have already the capacity to extinguish all mammalian life on Earth. We have enough nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons stored. To collectively, it's enough to kill all the mammals, all of them on Earth, including ourselves. So we have, if we don't learn how to cooperate, sooner or later, there's going to be an epidemic of this kind of warfare. The kind of warfare that we've for so long thought of as, as unthinkable is actually being considered today tactical nuclear weapons, tactical biological attack. These things are being considered. If we don't change, if we don't learn how to cooperate, we will compete ourselves to death. That's what a weapon is. A weapon is a symbol of competition, my competition with you. That's what a hug is, a symbol of my cooperation with you. This is the new paradigm, cooperate and conserve. If we don't conserve our planet, we're going to lose it. Now, if we do, and the signs of change are everywhere. The struggle, if we do this, and we, we, we move into this new paradigm, this paradigm could last for millions of years. The first one lasted two million years. The second lasted 10,000 years, and it's brought us here, to this point where we've almost used up everything we have, and we're competing each other to death in the streets, in, from country against country, 
race against race, religion against religion, human being against human being, road rage in, on the street. It's coming out, this is everywhere. Compete and consume is going to destroy us. We have to stop. The great news is that millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world already know it and already feel it. The politicians are lagging behind. The business leaders are lagging behind, but the people are already there. People are standing in the street. Now, Francis Fukuyama, sorry, it's a very long answer to your question, but I'm nearly getting to the end of the point. Francis I, I didn't even have a question. Yeah. I, well, with Greg, well, you no, just no, got to say, poof, go. You know, the gates open and... Okay. Francis Fukuyama and a number It'll be of a great ride, I promise you. <laughs> at the end of 9-11, um, no, at the end of the time when people could consider this, after a few weeks, when a few of the thinkers in the world started analyzing it and saying, what is this thing? Francis Fukuyama and others called it the clash of civilizations. It's a clash between the civilization of Islam and the civilization of Western democracies. It isn't. That's not what's going on. I mean, the real struggle political struggle that's going on is between Shia Islam and Sunni Islam. We're ancillary players, like the ancillary species I talked about before. We are not in the center of that. That is a struggle, a death struggle, between Shia Islam and Sunni Islam. My hope is that Shias and Sunnis will one day realize that they are brothers and sisters in the same faith. They just have a slightly different picture of it, but it's the same thing. There is one faith, and they will join together as brothers and sisters. That's my hope. And that this terrible, terrible conflict, which is claiming for every one Western Democrat who is killed in this struggle, which we call terrorism and so on, there are hundreds of Muslims who are dying. It's Shia Muslims killing Sunni Muslims everywhere. The real struggle is not between the West and Islam. The real struggle is between people who can see the new paradigm and people who can't. The people who can see it know that we have to be cleaner. This planet is our mother. Would we throw rubbish on our mother? Would we take the rubbish tin and just tip it onto our mother? We wouldn't do that. This planet is our mother and we're tipping rubbish onto her. We're disrespecting her. We're insulting her. That has to change. We have to start to love her. We are fighting one another endlessly. It has to change. We have to cooperate. Those who can see that, who can see that we have to be cleaner, we have to be greener, and I mean cleaner in every way, cleaner in our hearts, cleaner in our minds. Those who can see that we have to be cleaner, we have to be greener, we have to be more sustainable, we have to be sustainable, not more sustainable, we have to be sustainable. We have to look at this planet, this biosphere, this thing in which we live, and say it's not just a thing out there, we are part of it, it is part of us. If we hurt it, we hurt ourselves. Those who feel that already, who love their planet, who want to love their fellow human beings, the people who want peace and harmony, who want creativity, who want freedom, who want liberty, who want governments that don't just represent a party, that represent the human spirit, who help us to reach our destiny. That's what we want. We want governments that can see that we can be a glorious, wonderful thing in this universe. Our human hearts, our human minds can be glorious. We want governments who can see that and who help us to achieve it. Not governments who help themselves to get elected for their, their gain in that particular moment. There are hundreds of millions of people across the world. They're in Turkey, they're in Brazil, they're in Madrid, they're in New York. They're, they're called Occupy Wall Street, they're called Anonymous, they're called whatever the hell you want to call them, but they are people who can see a better way and who want it. And they're ready to, to put their lives on the line for it. They're standing in the streets. The streets of this planet, it's going to get worse before it gets better. The streets will be filled with anger and tear gas. All the great streets everywhere. It will be anger and tear gas. That tear gas is making people, what do we call it, tear gas? It's making people cry. Yes, let me tell you, they're already crying. That's why they're in the street. They're bringing their tears into the street. They're bringing their anger into the street. And they're not saying, I want Islam or I want Western democracy. They're saying, I want to love the world in which I live. This is the new paradigm. It's coming. And we are the most privileged people in the history of our human species because we're living right in the middle of it. You can see forces pulling it back who have vested interests in saying more oil, more gold, more profit, and they're pulling us back. And there are hundreds of millions pulling us forward, saying a better way, a better world. And it will come. 
I have every confidence that it will come. I love my species. I love our creativity. I love our beauty. And I'm 100% sure that we'll get there. I feel it. We don't have to get there. We could destroy ourselves. It's in our own hands. But I feel we will. And that movement toward the new paradigm, which could, because it's such a supportive paradigm, compete and consume was pretty good, but it only lasted 10,000 years. And we nearly used everything up. Cooperate and conserve can last for millions of years. If we cooperate with each other, if we conserve our planet, there's no end to it. The planet will always be there for us. We can go on for millions and millions of years in this way. So this thing we're entering now is the most exciting, fascinating period in the history of the world. And that's why fact is stranger than fiction today. I was going to ask um, you, um, you never read fiction when you're writing it. You always read nonfiction. And I think we've just been subjected to what Greg's been reading for the last few years uh, in a very beautiful way. Uh, but quite seriously, is that true? And if so, uh, what, what triggers that kind of behavior? Yeah, that's true. When I'm writing fiction, I'm, I'm here at the moment in Bombay writing the sequel to Shantaram. It's called The Mountain Shadow. And it's a book which um, I hope gives people, people who like Shantaram, I hope that they get two pages into this and they say, okay, it's, we're on another ride. Here we go again. It's another big fat ride that's going to take us somewhere. I want people who like Chantaram to love the next book. And I'm putting all of my heart and soul into it, literally my heart and soul, into this book here in Bombay. And I'm so happy to be doing it. But when I'm writing fiction, I never read fiction for two reasons. If it's not good fiction, if you pick up a book and it's not good, and let's face it, some fiction is not good. All the fiction I wrote before Chantaram was rubbish. It's like, it's true, they, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hour rule, and it is like that. I had to do 10,000 hours of writing novel after novel, you know, novella after novella that, that were awful before I could write Chantaram. And I lost them all. I was writing while I was on the run, 10 years on the run as a fugitive, and every time I'd write a new book, I'd, I was constantly writing. I'd work on it, and I'd have a whole manuscript in my bag, and sometimes the police would be chasing me, and I'd have to leave it quite often. No, 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 the bullet would get stuck in the manuscript. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. Me. But um, thankfully, I, I never actually got shot at by the policeman. Other people, yes, but not the police. I would have to leave it behind. And at first, I was grieving and grieving and grieving. And it took me a long time to, get, to come to grips with this concept of having lost work. You lose a friend of mine is a great um, artist, a collage artist, and he's 70-something years old. And uh, he, his house burned down a couple of years ago with everything in it, in Montauk, in New York. He lost everything. Peter Beard, a great artist. He lost it all. A lifetime of work lost. Um, mine is on a much smaller scale, but I know what it feels like to lose your work. You have to get out of a window, climb down a fire escape, run across a roof, the police are chasing you, so you leave the heavy bag with your manuscript behind, and I lost so much work. It wasn't until I started to write Chantaram that I realized why I'd lost it. It was a kind of spiritual protection that protected me from publishing horrible stuff. Because <laughs> it was pretty bad. So. You have to write a lot of bad books before you can write a good one. It just works that way. I'm not sure why. I suppose you have to play a lot of bad piano before you can be a good pianist. So the thing is, um, if the work is bad, and some work is, as mine was, it depresses the hell out of you. When you're trying to write, you need things to elevate you. You need a spiritual dimension in your life. You need to be in touch with that thing that's stronger than you are, bigger than you are. And bad writing, well, it's like for me as a writer, it's like bad writing is one of the most depressing things that you can ever hold in your hand. Um, however, so I don't, and it gets, I get, can get very depressed. However, the opposite is even worse. It could be good writing. And if it's good, then you're, you're lost. Because it starts to infect your work, and it gets in there. If I'm reading Shakespeare, when I'm writing my own work, I discover it. I have to stop because I start forsoothing everywhere in there. I start sounding like Shakespeare. I've got the virus of Shakespeare in my head. It's like a song that you can't forget out of your head, you know. And you get good work is like that. If the phrases are really good and it works and it's magical, you can't get it out. So then you start, and it's critically important to preserve your own voice, the authorial voice, the voice that people recognize and say, if you have 10 pages on a, on a table and you've never read the books, but you know that one came from Salman Rushdie, one came from Ernest Hemingway, one came from Gregory Roberts, one came from somebody else, you should be able to, even if you've never read those books, you should be able to pick the page up, read it, and say, that's Salman Rushdie. Or pick it up and say, that's Gregory David Roberts, that's GDR, I know. I read Shantaram, that's him. Or someone should be able to say, that's Ernest Hemingway, et cetera, et cetera, or Virginia Woolf, or whatever. 
That's your authorial voice. That's the voice that speaks inside of the, the minds and the hearts of your readers, and they should be able to recognize that. So when you're writing in a creative process, you need to preserve that authorial voice. You need to stop it being intruded upon by either bad writing or even worse, really good writing that's better than yours. That's the terrible catastrophe. So I don't read fiction, I read non-fiction. And um, it's very ha healthy for me because it's a total break from what I'm doing. What I'm writing, it's rhapsodic, it's passionate. I'm, I'm literally in the rapture when it's good. I'm in the rapture, I push away from the chair sometimes and I'm dancing and going nuts. I always write listening to music. And it's just, uh, it's, for me, it's the, it's the greatest elation to, to think that that is a good sentence. That's a very, very good, you cannot improve on that sentence. You can't take out a comma, you can't add a full stop, you can't take a single word or a single sound, a single thing from the cadence of that sentence and make it worse. Anything, you touch it, it'll be worse. It cannot be better. It's right. And that sense of something that's right, that's coming from you and, and so on, wherever it comes from, who knows where that comes from. But that sense that it's right can be intoxicating. And I, get, I literally get drunk on it. I stopped drinking 23 years ago, and now I get drunk on my work. I used to write like every writer of fiction when you're young in those days, with a bottle of whiskey and an ashtray. Um, and I would start typing because there were no computers in those days. When I was a young writer, 18, 19, selling stories for money in magazines and writing. And I used to, at the end of a session, I used to look and the bottle would be empty and the ashtray would be full. Now I don't smoke and I don't drink. And I discovered that actually the best work I've ever done is the work that I come to with the cleanest possible mind and the cleanest possible heart when I come into it. So um, as I'm escaping from this very passionate, very emotional, very rhapsodic um, work where you're lit almost in a trance state when you're writing and it's working. That's why the music is so important. It's like that's my Sufi connection to what I'm doing. The music that's playing, I carefully pick the, the music and the sounds. When you're in that state, you need something that's actually going to bring you down because you can't stay there all the time. So you need something. So I sit and I read science and I love it. It takes me out of that raptured state into a state which is actually feeding my mind and feeding my knowledge and feeding my understanding of the world. And I know these books of science that I read, they're coming from people who dedicate their lives to making us understand some critically important thing that's gonna be a part of the big story. When we get there as a species, when we achieve our destiny, it'll be all those people who studied and learned and shared their knowledge with us um, about who we are, why we are, and what is our relationship to the universe. Those are the books that ground me, nourish my mind, fill me with ideas again, and then I go back into that trance state to write again, and so on. So that's why. So Greg, uh, we, we were discussing this, um, we've discussed this many times before, but we live in a world that is so much more interactive than it's ever been. So you can spend a whole evening looking at uh, videos on YouTube, and it's fact, but it's also entertainment. See this guy dancing at America's Got Talent, see this video of somebody contorting herself, or whatever it might be. Reality television. So, is there any space, <laughs> no, I, know, I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Is there any space in this world for fiction? Is there any need for it? It's a good question. Um, I, I think there is. I think it's changed a lot. <laughs> I think that uh, in, in the, when, it, when, we, when we began our, our um, non-internal communication with each other. Previously, all the communication was done with, with our voices, with our hands, with our bodies. And then we started having devices that were between us. I communicated to you through a device. It, it's a book, it's a newspaper, it's a radio, it's a TV. There's a thing between me and you that is the communication device. Previously, all the communication that could be done had to be done with the human voice, the human face, with the human body. And I think the beginning point, by the way, from where we, we were connected to our uh, ape and great ape ancestors, the point of transition for us was the point where, for me, when I think about it, what is it that took us from that to modern humans? I think it's um, the connection between ourselves and a sense of awe. The first person early hominid human who stood, already was standing on two feet, already was living in a domesticated human group rather than a chimp group, already was making fire, already was making sharpened tools. 
One day, one of those people saw a sunset, this is my vision, and just raised a finger and pointed at it for another to experience and enjoy. And there's a difference between pointing at a nest that might have eggs in it, look, I can't, I'm a little older, I can't climb that tree, but you can climb, and point and say food, or point to a deer, or point, point to a zebra, or whatever it is. But to point at a sunset is an entirely different level of human communication. And the real communication for us began with that, a sense of shared awe at the beauty of things. That's the heart of our real human communication. And the best things we ever hear from any religion, from any friend, from our mother, from anybody, the best things we ever hear are things that express a shared sense of awe at the beauty of things around us, of ourselves and of the world. So that communication lasted for a very long time. We communicated, with, we still do it, with our eyes, with our words, with our gestures, with our body. But then things started becoming, settling in between us. And it was, let's say, for example, now it's books, newspapers, televisions. Those things interpreted the world and then gave it to us in the form of a narrative. That could be a drama. It could also be the news. It's um, an intermediary source looking at the world, trying to make sense of it, packing it into a narrative and feeding it to us. And that's what characterized our communication from the beginning of the book, from Gutenberg, from the, the 14, late 1400s, where we have printing press, books becoming available, all the way through to radio, which was again doing the same thing, then to television and movies, and the internet. At first, the internet was the same. It was feeding us stuff. Now it's changed. People have taken it, and they are communicating. They're cutting out the middleman. They're communicating directly. They're using Facebook. They're using Twitter. They're using social networks. They're using so many different ways of communicating with, with each other and saying, I don't need you to package the narrative and tell me. I can talk to my friend and communicate my narrative there. So this is this huge, gigantic exchange of narratives going on all the time. Now, in the midst of that, where we are now creating the narrative, we are the narrative, where people who are talking with one another about it, it might be something simple like, I made scrambled eggs today, it's the best time, first time it was ever a success and I'm so happy my scrambled eggs were good. Or it can be, uh, listen, there is a site that's giving support. If you go on this site, even just clicking on the site will add $1 onto a support site for people suffering in Uttarakhand. Information as profound as this, information as simple as I made scrambled eggs and I'm so happy it was nice. You put this thing together, it's becoming a narrative where we are communicating with each other. Now, and the last part of this, for a lot of that period, what fiction did was take the mysteries that were slowly starting to be discovered and understood by science and, and by philosophy and so on. It took those, because the language is so obscure, it was so difficult, it took them, it turned them into a fictional narrative, and writers, fiction writers, gave us the news of the world, gave us the information, the understanding that was being gathered. But we don't need that anymore. We need, now we have popular science writers. We have the Malcolm Gladwells of this world, world and a hundred more like them, who are taking the science, taking the understanding, taking the knowledge, and creating it in, uh, putting it into a digestible, comprehensible package for us, who are doing that. What fiction has to do, the thing that fiction has now, is to go into a new narrative, in my view. Fiction has to do that thing that cannot be done simply by the facts. You can have a documentary like An Inconvenient Truth, and this documentary can reach lots and lots of people. The thing that's going to make you get out of your, cha your chair and actually do something, actually stand up, is when you read something that makes the hair stand up on your arm, that makes your heart beat faster, that makes you passionately involved, that makes you think, I have to do something. And that is what fiction writers do. We talk to the heart and the soul. We don't talk to the mind. There is an aspect in there, but we talk to the heart and the soul. There's so many people now who are great at talking to the mind. We don't really, fiction writers don't need to do that anymore. We need to move on and purely move into the heart and the soul of the people who read our work and make them love their planet. Make them love each other. That's what it's about. So let's um, flip it around and talk on the, since you started off on the talking from the point of view of fiction. So what's the challenge? Imagination. What's, what's the challenge for a writer's imagination today? Because on the one hand, I agree with you that fiction talks to the heart and the soul, 
and not to the mind. On the other hand, I believe that if you stand up and actually donate, it's because you see something that's actually factual, which just shakes your world and, you, and you, you know, you're inspired to do something. I've always believed documentaries have a much stronger activist uh, result than a Mr. and Mrs. Iyer, which is sort of a soft, soft, uh, soft weapon for uh, communal harmony, etc. I'm just I'm putting it to you that way. But outside of that, what is, where, where will the excitement and where will the energy and where will the, the madness, if you will, uh, in fiction come from? What is the challenge for a writer's imagination today if everything is out there? I think, um, you know, if we go back to look at um, the Arab Spring, uh, one of the huge cataclysmic events that's happened in our lifetime that we were privileged enough to see, anybody who's been watching the Arab world since 1870, um, you know, would, would never have predicted that we would see this. And it's happening. It's a movement for change in the Arab world, a movement that says we're choking under this kind of despotism and we want to be free. It started in Algeria, ostensibly because a young man who was a graduate um, student who had graduated from university, who couldn't find a job, was selling vegetables illegally and fruit on the street. A policeman came and fined him. And when he protested and said, for God's sake, I'm a graduate and I can't find a job and I'm trying to make a, a few bucks doing this. I'm not stealing from anybody. I'm not beating anyone. It turned into an exchange and the policeman slapped this person. That's the narrative. That's what we hear. And next thing, people are in the street. That didn't happen. The policewoman, it wasn't a man, it was a policewoman. The policewoman never touched the guy. And the guy had um, not said to her, I'm a graduate student. In fact, he isn't a graduate student. He wasn't. He died. The thing is, the fact of the reality of their world, the fact of their world was a choking despotism. Ben Ali was robbing the country blind, living, he, had, he was a multi, multi-billionaire, and the people were starving in the street. Graduates couldn't get jobs, and people were frustrated and horrified by this situation. The narrative that sparked them to come into the street was not the factual narrative. The narrative was, here is a graduate student who graduated, who's put in years of study, and who got his degree, and can't get a job, and he's selling an apple on the street. His desperation is making him sell an apple on the street, and the police beat him for it. People said, enough, and they came onto the streets. That's a narrative. That is not the fact. Look it up. Go on Google and research the story. It's not what happened, but the story that motivated the people is that, that narrative, that is fiction. And the thing is, the facts, can motivate people every day to feel unhappy, to feel disenfranchised, to feel angry. But the narrative is the thing that spoke directly to their heart, directly to their soul and said, this is simply unjust and it has to stop. That's what drove people into the street. So this is the difference and we need both. We need the facts and we need the narratives that make us stand and cheer and, for, for the, and make us believe that we can do this right and not mess it up every time. I've been um, asked to throw, throw it open to the floor for any questions, parallel theories, disagreements, debates. Yes, please. You, know, you go back to the 1930s and you have The Wizard of Oz, which was based on uh, facts. Fiction that came out of fact, I'm talking about the American political scene at the time, the Great Depression. Now, we've recently had uh, Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, and fact like the, the Giddich, the World Cup, come out of that. So it, it's almost as if fact and fiction have come full circle. Where do you see it go from here? I mean, if you're understanding, uh, you know, that was fiction based on fact. Here we've got facts come out of fiction. Where is it? Uh, what's the future? Or... <laughs> I said, I know Rahul so well that I love him. And they said, you love him? And I said, I love him. I'd take a bullet for him. I said, not in a vital organ. But it, the fleshy part of the thigh, it's all his. Come on, man. I'll take it for him. To... So, yeah, the thing is this, um, I think. We went through this whole period, in answer to your question, of reality TV. And there was a period when it first started, and we had Big Brother and all, and it first began. There was this concept that drama was dead. And every major newspaper in the world and every major, major literary critic and everybody else was saying, this is, this is the death of drama, it's all gone. Now it's gonna be permanent, non-stop, back-to-back reality TV, 24 hours a day, that's all you're gonna get. Since then, 
we have had a rifacimento, a revival, a renaissance in drama that is better than anything that ever went before it. And I loved the drama before it, on TV, I'm saying, for example. So this reality TV came in, swamped everything. Now, as in, in, a result, uh, in, in response to it, there is um, Homeland. Anybody seen that? I mean, the best individual performance by of an actress I've ever seen in my life in that TV series. Absolutely astonishing. We have Boardwalk Empire. We have The Sopranos, Gandolfini, who just died re just, just so recently, tragically. Um, we had these programs that came that were so well written so well acted, so well produced, and so compelling in their stories. It goes on and on and on, whatever it is, Game of Thrones, it's just, it doesn't stop. The dramas are so compelling, they're so fantastic, that the best writers in the world, from every country on earth, are working in TV now. So we went from a period where it's the death of drama and it's all over, to suddenly the best drama we've ever had. How does that happen? It happens because people can be fascinated by the lives of others, you put a webcam in somebody's house, other people will just watch it because it's fascinating. <laughs> Look what he's doing now, man. It's like, why? Why is he doing that? What happened? <laughs> it's, <laughs> but truly, it's, it's kind of fascinating. But the thing that nourishes you, the real food for your soul, is coming from the narrative. People have an unending hunger for great drama, for great story. We've always had it. It's, it goes all the way back to the hunt. It goes all the way back to the hunters returning from the hunt, the fire the food, the smell of the food, cooking, that's survival, that smell. It doesn't sm smell like anything else. It smells like survival. We will make it through this night. We will make it through these days. While we sat there, sated, smelling the food, and so on, huddled together around the fire, the hunters gathered, and the best of them, who had a talent for it, would tell the story of the hunt. And it came with big horns like this. And then we came with our spears, and we walked, and we moved into this space. And when, you, when we sat and watched it, sitting there with our eyes wide, the children and others reenacting re the hunt, watching the hunt being reenacted, sitting there saying, oh my God, it's so scary, and watching the whole thing, and we're so lucky that we got the food and all. We still do that today in a cinema. We still sit together around the fire of the screen. We still watch the narrative of the hunters telling us their story. We still sit there with awe and our eyes wide because we have a hunger for it. It's the story of us. That's what we're hungry for. The fact of us is fascinating and, in, and interesting, even compelling. But the story of us is food. Our story is our nourishment. Uh, what kind of music would you be listening to when writing your book? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm tremendously serious about it. I make, um, I mean, I can say in one word, Bollywood. Um, <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. I love it. And there's something about the rhythms, something about the, the melodies and the beautiful words. I can take a song. I can take a song like Tanhadil and I go, Psh. no, I'm straight there. I can play it eight times in a row and I'm in a mood. I'm in a feeling that I can channel into my work. So I make lists and I fill them with, it might be, you know, the book is called The Mountain Shadow. So it's TMS on my in my um, computers, and it will say TMS Romantic. And so it's filled with love songs, and it's, I want to be drunk with love when I'm writing a love scene, I want to be drunk with it, and so I'm listening to that. I have, you know, TMS Action, you know, TMS Fast, TMS Speedy, and it's filled with really fast songs and I, that just work for me, that, that get me agitated, and I'm there for an action scene that I'm writing. And I have TMS um, Soft, and slow, where I'm thinking of, I want, it's more a contemplative piece, it's more where I'm trying to take a, a physical thing like a landscape and make other people smell the trees and, and feel the drops of water between their finger, fingertips. When I'm in that, I, I need the, the more slow and more contemplative music. So I have a mix, a gutbud mix of um, songs that work for me, entertainers that work for me. The key to all of it is that it's anthemic. It's a rich, lush sound, whatever it is, with whoever's, whether it's Cascade doing house, which I love, or whether it's you know, Bollywood music, it has to be, for me, it has to be rich, it has to be lush, it has to be a, a, a wall of, of, of beauty that I can fill my head with when I'm working. So that's how I work. That was a fascinating uh, conversation between two intellectuals. Question to both of you. <laughs> Hold up right there. Oh. <laughs> No, no, you, you too, Rahul, sorry. No, you, you, you set the stage. Anyway, Thank you. Uh, if you, Thank both you. of you gaze into the crystal ball, what has to start has to end. 
So when do you think in your uh, wisdom will the world end? One. And secondly, when can... Will the world end? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, that's not such a small question, so are you sure you want to ask a second part? Because knowing how Greg goes off, no, just <laughs> he's going to start where the world started from, and this is going to take time. <laughs> this is going to take time. What's the trailer for your new book, what, if we can know what's it about, if it's possible? Right, so two questions, very minor ones. When will the world end, and what's your new book about? The world will end when it has to end. Um, I'm serious, I mean, uh, it could be an asteroid impact, uh, you know, the last one, <laughs> the, it could be an asteroid impact um, that is so, so large that it shifts the orientation of our planet toward the sun and everything dies. Um, and our planet just becomes another cold, hard rock, um, you know, revolving around a star. This is possible. We've had asteroid impacts before. The end of the Jurassic was a gigantic asteroid impact. Um, that's possible any day, and we can't see that coming. Uh, we could extinguish ourselves from this planet. We could make ourselves extinct. We have the capacity. We have all the weapons we need, as I said before. We could do that. My feeling is that we will survive. My hope and my feeling is, because we're simply, I just think we're too beautiful to mess it up forever. We're going to wake up. We're going to look at how beautiful we are. We're going to see it. We're going to see what we feel. This is the gift of the universe. No other animal on this planet feels it. Plan animals have feelings, but they don't have our feelings. Animals are locked into their animal nature. A chimp is a chimp. Chimpanzees are territorial, um, competitive, aggressive, hierarchical, patriarchal. We, because we're connected with them, are also territorial, hierarchical, patriarchal, competitive, aggressive. But we have a human nature which is capable of overriding this animal nature. I mean, everywhere you look, when open the front page of the newspaper. Just look at the front page. Every bad thing is us being chimpanzees, competing with each other, aggression with each other, territorial, hierarchical, all hierarchies from the CEO to the king or the poobah or whatever. And all of this, and we are also patriarchal. Where are the women? Where is the respect for women? Where is the admiration and love for them? Look in the paper. It's not filled with love and admiration for women. We are chimps, but we have human nature. And our human nature, unlike our animal nature, is capable of overriding this thing. We are, our human nature can create an idea that's so beautiful that we will die for it. It's called democracy. There's no democratic front of chimpanzees. Even though we behave like chimps every day, because we still have it in us, there's no democratic front of chimpanzees. We can create an idea called feminism, to say let's have some equality in this world. There's no feminist front of chimpanzees. They don't have that concept. They can't do it. They're in their animal nature. We can override our animal nature, and we do it every day. We express our humanity. When you open the front page of the thing, you'll see all competition, aggression, consumption. Nasty. You turn the back page, you'll see sport, competition, aggression, etc. And it's our animal nature playing itself out. And we've ritualized it. Instead of hurting each other violently, we're playing sport as a way to ritualize this. But you turn to other pages in the middle of the newspaper, you'll see the cultural pages, you'll see the music, the dance, you'll see the poetry, you'll see the movies, you'll see the beauty, you'll see the love that is in us. That's our, entirely our human nature. That is exactly what we are as human beings. The other pages are us expressing our animal nature, which we still have. I'm 100% confident. I love my species. I'm so proud to be a human. I love what we are, despite all the faults. I've been chained to a wall and tortured. I've been beaten, starved, stabbed, humiliated, degraded. I've been two years underground in solitary confinement. I had so many things happen that not a second in my life have I lost my faith in humanity and my love for who we are and what we are. Worse than that, than any of the things that have been done to me are the bad things I've done in my life. I've done very bad things and I'm ashamed of them. I'm disgraced by them every single day of my life. But that too. Even my own failures and flaws has never shaken my love for who we are and what we can be. I'm fully confident that we will make it. I'm fully confident that we will turn this corner. We will begin to love our planet. We will begin to love each other, to cooperate with each other. I'm fully confident we will do it. And that when we, when we do, barring asteroids, the end of the world will be a very, very, very long way off. We have a long, long way to our destiny and we will get there. We're a young species. We're arguably the youngest species on this planet. Everybody else has been around here millions of years more than us. And here we are, very young. We're learning. We're babies. But we learn fast. 
we're humans, and we'll get there. I fully believe it. So is that the answer to your first question? Greg, before you answer the second question, I must tell you that um, somebody might have misheard what Greg said was going to be the end of the world because somebody heard steroid impact and <laughs> he went running out because he was a really buff guy. He's like, I'm going to cause the end of the world, you know? Gregory Roberts reports that steroid impact is going to destroy the world and suddenly tomorrow the bodybuilding industry just collapses. <laughs> so, um, I think we all want to know the answer to the second question anyway. So let's, let's find out what the next book is about um, and then we can take a question from a lady if there is a question from a lady. Here. But let, let Greg first answer. Uh, just to, because we've kept you a long time, I have kept you a very long time, um, it, just to make it simple and, and, and as quick as possible. Uh, the book is called The Mountain Shadow. It's a sequel to Shantaram. I started, I planned it um, 18 years ago. And uh, I worked with a complex art architecture with 22 layers of allegorical depth and symbolic depth built into the book. Um, now, the theme of the book is the search. It's a sequel to Shantaram. So all those characters alive at the end of Shantaram go on into the next book. And we have new characters as well. Most of the adventures are in Bombay. We travel to Germany, Italy, and Sri Lanka and all the rest of it is in Bombay. And the theme of the book is the search. The search for meaning, the search for purpose, the search for love, the search for identity, the search for home, the existential search. We're born into a search, we're searchers. It's what we are. If you had to put a tombstone for the entire human race, you would put, um, human, here lies the human race, and underneath it, searching for love. That's what we are. Our Life is a search for love. And so I'm using the search as the essence of this book. Everyone in, in the book is involved in, just as in Shantaram, the book was about the exile experience. Everyone in the book is an exile. And they all find themselves together in this group of exiles in the island city. And it's an exploration of what it means to live in exile. I knew I had, I lost, when I escaped from prison, I lost my name, I lost my country, I lost my date of birth, I lost my family. I was the ultimate exile. I had nowhere else to go. I couldn't go back. Wherever else I went, it had to be somewhere else. I was exiled from my home. So I wrote about the exile experience, and every character in Shantaram is an exile. Similarly, in this book, everyone is searching. And the characters who stop searching are the characters who fall. They lose their humanity, and they fall. So it's about the search. It's an exploration of what it means to be involved in this great search. How much of fact and how much of fiction is Shantaram? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I get five cents every time somebody asks me that question, and you just made me a millionaire. Um, <laughs> the experiences are real. All the experiences that are uh, in the book um, that are about the character Lynn are my experiences. Have I loved like that? Like Lynn loves Scarla? Yes. I'm writing that love. I'm feeling that love. Uh, if you want to know what it was like to be in the Kolaba lockup at that time in the 1980s, the book will tell you. They did helicopter to me. I've experienced it. Tied with your, from your ankles and your arms beside you all the way to your neck with Hessian rope. Around and around. God knows where they buy it. There's so much Hessian. Where do they get this coconut fiber rope? Put it around you. I mean, it's yards and yards and yards of it. And then when you're totally bound, they pick you up and put a hook through the back and pull you up and then spin you around. And as you're spinning, they hit you with the lattes. Five, six guys. Luckily, every now and then, one of them hits somebody else and says, hey, what are you doing, man? <laughs> What's we hitting him, man? He's the pilot helicopter, not me. Anyway, <laughs> if you want to know what it was like in that lockup then, that will tell you. It was exactly like that. Similarly with the prison at Arthur Road and with the other experiences that come, my experiences on the street, my experiences in war, they are taken from my life. The characters are all created. The dialogue is all created. It's all me. The narrative, the structure is all me. So when you take a character like the Prabhakar, a character that people like, there was a guide in life. He did meet me in Bombay. He did take me around the city for a couple of months and he did take me to his village. And when we came back after six months of living in the village, I did live in the slum near this guy. He's gone now, God rest his soul. But I can tell you, and he knows, he knows. He was a scoundrel. He was, um, he was a womanizer. He had three wives. He drank constantly. And he was a two-drink screamer. Like two drinks, he was totally drunk out of his mind. 
He was a thief. He was a liar. If you took off your chain and, and washed your face in the jogal party, you look, dry your face, chain is gone. Are? Are Prabhakar, are chain kude? Chain kude? Say, what chain? Are you accusing me? You're, you'll make me cry. You're breaking my heart, man. Take a rock, beat me on the head with it. Break my head, but don't accuse me. <laughs> don't accuse me. I'm your brother. Prabhakar, chain kude. What are you saying? I'm dying. I'll get razor blades. I'll cut my face, man. I'll cry. Are you killing? I'll take my life. Prabhakar, chain kude. I couldn't help it. I took it and bought shoes. But look, aren't they nice? <laughs> you like, you like my shoes? You like? And every damn time, I did. I would say, actually, they're damn good shoes, man. Okay, forget it. So the guy, if I wrote about the real guy who was lying and cheating and doing crazy stuff, I loved him. His own family used to say to me, please, you come anytime you like, but don't bring him. Please. <laughs> He's only making Tamasha trouble. It's so bad. Please don't bring him. I like this guy very much. He passed on. If I wrote about a real person, if I did not create a character, I could not have created a portal, a gateway into India. I, I needed to create a character people could love. And that if something happened to that character, they would grieve as if they'd lost a friend. And so I, I had to create someone to do that. If I used the real person, nobody would have come to India. <laughs> so <laughs> I created a character because I wanted people to love the country and the people as I do. I wanted them to come here and experience this miracle called India. <laughs>